ancient Greece as the ancestor of everything that has become so common and familiar to us was quite different in terms of relations between a man and a woman. However, something, especially about unfaithful husbands, seems to have remained untouched since then. Also, the desire to get as much pleasure as possible is rooted in the days of ancient myths and heroes. As Heraclitus wrote, nature herself requires us to choose enjoyment as the motto of our lives. The goal of every sane person is to pluck pleasures with the greatest delight. Suppressing the desire won't make anyone wiser or happier. The basis of everything is a man. This was the main rule. Man is the basis of fertility, so the reproductive organ was both a symbol of good luck and a guardian against evil spells and even an object of envy of women. Therefore, in ancient Greece, in the form of a leather male organ, were sold everywhere, and any woman could buy the one she liked. And even if it was just a trifle, it was still a symbol of fertility. In fact, Fertility symbols were everywhere in Greek life. People had them skillfully made of stones or even gold in their houses, and in temples they were in forms of statues. Damage of such a sculpture in a temple or elsewhere was considered a very bad omen. By the way, the standard of male beauty among the Greeks was a small organ, which could be very clearly observed in ancient sculptures and images. The small size was an indicator of nobility and attributed to the blue bloods. Owners of a large reproductive organ were usually ridiculed and condemned. Since the man was the hegemon, there was no place left for the woman. In family life, a Greek woman was obliged to do only two things – look after the house and give birth to children. She practically had no right to leave the house alone, only accompanied by a slave, maid, or elderly relative. Of course, there were exceptions, they will be discussed later. And even though it may seem quite wild, the birth of a girl was not welcomed in families. So very often, a girl could be given by her parents to a brothel. Also, a daughter could be given as a wife to anyone who offered a sufficient bright price to get rid of her as soon as possible. Finally, here is a family tradition which today will definitely seem wild. It was forbidden to kiss wives in public. This was condemned in every possible way, and such a husband was considered handpicked. The only situation in which a man could kiss his wife on the lips was in front of the house, and only to check if she had drunk wine. In other words, kissing the wife in public was a kind of sobriety test, and a sign that the better half was drinking too much. In Greek Sparta, there was another strange custom. When a young Spartan got married, his bride was shaved bald and dressed as a boy. This was done so as not to make the newlywed afraid while going to the bedchamber with his wife. It seemed more natural for a wife to look like a boy, which whom the Spartans, in fact, got their first experience. Man's love. This logically brings us to the relationship between a man and a man. In this regard, there was absolutely nothing to be ashamed of, and such relationships were considered absolutely normal. The bisexuality of a man was commonplace in ancient Greece, so the passion between men did not cause any shame or condemnation. It was believed that an older man should be active. If it happened the other way round, then it was considered unacceptable and shameful. The Greeks believed that the relationship of a young man with an older friend would develop a young man and help him to step into adulthood as a real man. The most striking example, and so to speak a model of such love, was the famous sacred troop of Greek warriors from Thebes, which consisted of male couples in love. In battle, men defending their beloved to the last breath, so the perseverance, stamina, and courage of this squad admired the Greeks greatly, as well as amazed the enemy. Prostitution. The words of a certain Athenaeus have come down to us. Look and see how bare-chested in thin clothes they are lined up in the open sun. You can choose anyone you like. Thin, fat, chubby, long, crooked, young, old, medium height, mature. You can get any of them without any risk for a small price. This suggests that prostitution in those days was an absolutely legal occupation. Of course, Prostitution was both male and female. In ancient Greece, brothels worked officially, 
work text and working in them was not considered something shameful. But male and female prostitution still had limitations. Girls, according to Greek laws, could do this from almost any age, but young men only starting from the age of maturity. Otherwise, the owner of the brothel could have some serious problems. The rules of good manners among the Greeks were considered intimacy with a young man who had reached puberty, but without facial hair. Female prostitution, which by the way was practiced by a large of the population, was divided into several types. At the lowest level were the poor nays, who worked with the pimps. By the way, pimping was considered a normal business in Greece. A higher status was held by the wanderers, who worked for themselves, offering services on the streets. Finally, the hetarei, that is, companions of joy, were the highest degree of the hierarchy. In today's reality, hetarei, escorts, are in fact that they were in ancient Greece. The girls were well-educated, gorgeous, and amazingly even had more rights and opportunities than the official wives. For example, only hetarei could practice art and which will seem incredible even philosophers and writers who chuckled at women devoting themselves to the family openly admired the hetere. By the way, the most famous hetere in history, Aspasia, first became the mistress of the prominent official and legislator Pericles, and then he left his lawful wife for the sake of a beautiful hetere. Another type belonged to the religious beliefs of the ancient Greeks. It was believed that intimacy with the temple servant correspond to a sacrifice. By the way, in the temples there were not only representatives of the fair half, but also boys. So the sacrifice could choose through whom to bring an offering to the gods. Habits and activities of ancient Greeks. If someone encroached on a lawful wife, he could expect the most serious punishment up to death penalty. Oral pleasures have also been quite popular. By the way, if a prostitute refused to do this, she could be officially beaten. As in ancient Rome, the Greeks also practiced orgies, usually held in the season of Dionysia, celebration in honor of the god of wine and fertility, Dionysus. After the solemn part, when columns of maidens with drinks and gifts passed through the streets, the official part began. Roughly speaking, people copulated with those who were found nearby. And by the way, in order to achieve excitement, self-flagellation was widely used. It was believed that this was not only a sacrifice to the gods, but also contributed to an increase in strength. Symposia. Cheating in ancient Greece was not considered something bad at all. Official wives should have simply ignored it. The man could do whatever he wanted. And the rich and noble Greeks liked to retire to the so-called symposiums. There they reclined on sofas, had philosophical conversations, drank wine, ate fruit. Well, from time to time they retired with a hetera who served this entire symposium. Contraceptive methods. But what really seemed wild and funny is the methods of contraception. For example, Aristotle offered vegetable oil as the best remedy which was poured, you understand where. And men, before intercourse, had to eat pomegranates and dates. But the most surprising, perhaps, is the advice of the Greek doctor Serenus. A woman should hold her breath, put her body back, because this way the seed will not penetrate inside, and then quickly sit down and sneeze.